Hi, John Kelly. I'd like to introduce you to a documentary film I just completed entitled Turner's Falls in the King Philip War. We're here at the falls in a period of but a few hours, over 200 Native Americans, mostly women and children, and 39 retreating English soldiers lost their lives. The massacre at the falls was one of the most significant battles of the King Philip War, for it marked the beginning of the end of the war. Now first, I want to thank Kevin McBride, David Bruhl, and the members of the Turner's Falls Battle Rifle Report. Also, Peter Thomas, Gary Sanderson, Ed Gregory, David White, Doug Harris, uh, Howard Clark, Bud Driver, Joe Graveline, and many others that contribute greatly to my project. Now, before we go on and explore the massacre at the falls in more detail, we must first try to answer a few questions to the best of our abilities. What, why, who, and where? What had happened? Why did it happen? Who were the players? And also the locations. So let's go back in time. The date, May 18th, 1676. The time, 8 p.m. The location? Hatfield, Massachusetts. Through the summer of 1675 until the early winter of 1676, several Native American tribes launched dozens of attacks against the English towns throughout the Connecticut River Valley between Springfield and Northfield. These attacks forced the English settlements at Northfield and Deerfield to be abandoned. By September of 1675, these events forced the Bay Colonies to send soldiers to garrison and fortify the remaining Upper River Valley settlements of Springfield, Hatfield, Hadley, and Northampton. During the winter of 1675 and 1676, the English towns experienced severe hunger and famine. Many of the English in the Hatfield and Hadley communities were refugees from the destroyed Northfield and Deerfield settlements and harbored a great deal of resentment towards the tribes gathered at the falls. The deaths of more than a hundred English soldiers and settlers in the Upper River Valley at the hands of the Indian enemy over the previous six months also contributed to a growing desire on the part of the settlers to attack the native people gathered at the Great Falls. Pocumscut. Two English boys taken captive during the earlier raid on Hatfield escaped and informed the settlers and garrisons at Hadley about the whereabouts of the natives at the falls. Armed with this new information, the militia gathered soldiers and settlers from Northampton, Hadley, Hatfield, and Springfield and prepared for an attack on the encampment. Most of the men, including Turner, had little or no combat experience, and some of the men were youths, no older than 16. Over the next two days, settlers and garrison troops from several towns assembled at Hatfield. By May 18th, Turner's relatively inexperienced forces were counting on the element of surprise. With 150 mounted men, they began their march after dark on May 18th. Benjamin Waite and experienced Hinsdale of Hadley were selected to serve as guides due to their experience and knowledge of the region. Captain William Turner's command included Lieutenant Holyoke, Isa Toy, John Lyman, John Dickinson, Joseph Kellogg, accompanied by Reverend Hope of Atherton. The troops passed through Hatfield Street with high hopes and determined hearts, crossing the meadows to the north, vowing vengeance for the stolen cattle. They winded their way slowly up the Pocumtuck Path, following the exact route which had led Bears and Lanthrop into an ambush nine months earlier. As they traveled through the dead of night, they came upon Bloody Brook. Guided by Hinsdale, they floundered through the dark morass which drank the blood of his father and three brothers nine months earlier. They passed with bated breath and clinched firelock. As the command makes their way to the Great Falls, they pass the abandoned ruins of Deerfield, where more than one of these men had built their homes and families. The horrible memories return September 12th, while the soldiers and settlers were at the Stockwell Fort for public worship. The Indians, taking advantage of the situation, attacked the town. The fort was ransacked and set on fire by the enemy who carried away or killed 
much of the settlers' livestock. They move onward, crossing the North Meadows. In the past few years, there's been a renewed interest in what exactly happened at the Great Falls, May 19, 1676. Let's speak to one of the men who sparked the interest. His name is David Brule. David Brule is the president of the Nolan Becca Project. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation of the history of the Native Americans through educational programs, art, history, music, and cultural events. Which brings us to the Battle of Great Falls project. Let's speak with David Brule. Hello, um, my name is David Brule, and I am a uh, native of this space, this Turner's Falls. I was born and raised here. And uh, I uh, left town as soon as I could. And when I came back, I started getting involved in a number of projects. So when I retired from teaching, the biggest event that occurred here, unfortunately, uh, happened in a matter of hours. And that was uh, on May 19th. 1676. came up with this idea of applying for a battlefield grant. The National Park Service runs an American battlefield protection program and um, we thought we'd take a stab at it because uh, this was an important event. It was vastly understudied and it was one of the most significant events in King Philip's War. We had all of this coalition of uh, tribes and towns and uh, it was just too much to resist so we landed the grant and that has been ongoing for the, for the last couple of years. We're really on the verge of um, rewriting history that doesn't have to be a bad thing this is based on multiple perspectives now rather than just the English um, uh, let's say chroniclers who put down their version of the battle so that's where we are right now. Uh, they will uh, resume field work more than likely in the late spring if we can get additional funding before we apply for the phase three of this battlefield grant. So that's the long and short of it. Before we go any further, who were the Pakumtuk natives of the upper Connecticut River Valley? To answer that question, we must go back in time. Let's say 10,000 years. Paleo hunters traveled the Connecticut River Valley, leaving behind many campsites which have been accurately carbon dated. The valley and its watershed attracted game which included great herds of caribou. Western Mass would have looked much like the Arctic Circle of today. Travel forward a few thousand years, we have large scale fishing around the waters such as Turner's Falls and a mile down the river, what is known today as the rock dam. These two areas were ideal locations for spearing and netting the migrating fish, such as salmon, shad, and sturgeon. Of all the species, salmon was very important to both the lifestyle and spirituality of the river Indians. Salmon willingly gave themselves up to humans, according to myths. Therefore, these fish held a special position of honor and respect. Salmon often was used as a symbol of determination, renewal, and prosperity. Imagine the dugout canoes lining the banks. This was the season of great joy and celebration. Different clans throughout the surrounding areas, we're talking hundreds of miles, would congregate each year, same time, same location. There'd be ceremonies thanking Mother Earth for their bounty, the time of storytelling, marriage proposals, catching up on the latest news, children playing on the banks of the river, the men lighting up their pipes, and of course, preserving their catch for future consumption. Before the arrival of the colonists to the New World, it was estimated that there were around 5,000 Pakomtaks living around the confluence of the Deerfield and Connecticut rivers, in which is now known as Deerfield Mass. There were many scattered villages and forts that occupied the land above the fertile valley below. The Pockentucks were actually a confederacy of about 20 sub-tribes. 
the Agawams of Springfield, the Warrenokos of Westfield, the Nonotoc of Northampton, Hadley, we have the Norotoc, Turner's Falls, Pocumscut, present day Northfield, the Squawkeeg, and so on. Kinship ties, trade alliances, and common enemies kept the alliance strong. Mother Earth and Father Sky provided them with all their needs. Now, four centuries ago, corn farming Indians of New York State were outproducing European wheat farmers. Green beans, lima beans, pumpkins, squash, corn, chestnuts, walnuts, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, grapes, and many other foods were gathered. Corn, beans, and squash, also known as the Three Sisters, were the principal crops of the Native American farmers of the Northeast and had been planted together at least 300 years before the Europeans arrived. Each family would plant about an acre of land. Small mounds would be created all over this acre. The three crops grown together were able to thrive and provide high yield quality food source. Let's travel 3,280 miles across the ocean to the old world of Europe, 1300 AD. Take a look at what the pilgrims had left behind. So where shall we start? The Black Death, the Great Famine, the Hundred Year War, deforestation of Europe and its natural resources? Well, let's start with the Black Death. Between 1347 and 1351, the Black Death killed about half of Europe's population in just four years. Which means if you lived in medieval Europe around the 1340s, you had a 50% chance of dying from it. From the 5th century to the 15th century, the Middle Ages were marked by plagues, wars, famines, civil uprisings, tyrannical oppression, religious control, and persecution. The Great Famine of 1315-1322 didn't help. It caused millions of deaths over an extended number of years and marked a clear end to the period of growth and prosperity from the 11th century to the 13th century. The period was marked by extreme levels of crime, disease, mass death, and even cannibalism. The crisis had consequences for the church, state, European society, and for future calamities to follow in the 14th century. Within the same time period, the deforestation of Europe. Many forest areas were largely destroyed due mainly to the falling of trees for firewood. Overgrazing of sheep and goats and other large livestock, the forest quickly turned to scrub. Deforestation led to erosion of the soils, including those suitable for agriculture. A vicious circle. And if that's not enough, the Hundred Year War between England and France, 1337-1453, death toll, 3.5 million people. Let's pause a moment. I think it's very important we understand the system of governance during the Middle Ages. Here's a pyramid chart, and of course on top of the pyramid is the king. We go down the pyramid, the king provides land to the nobles, condition, loyalty. Going down the pyramid, the nobles provide portions of their land to the knights. In return, the knights protect the nobles and the king. Going down to the bottom ladder, the knights protect the peasants from miraging pillagers. In return, the peasants are given enough food to farm for their families, but also have to feed the upper pyramid, the knights the nobles, the kings, and also pay other taxes, which attributed to the heavy death toll the peasants endured during the war. Both sides of the war understood easiest way to destroy an army is to destroy its food supply, which were the peasants. The other benefit for the marauding army is they need to be fed. Next question, what caused the uprising known as the King Philip War? The 17th century began an era of profound cultural changes for the Native Americans. 
over the previous hundreds of years or more, the lives in the culture of the Eastern Woodland Indians had changed very little. If any change took place, it would have involved small degrees. As I stated earlier, the environment provided them with all the natural resources required to meet their needs. After the arrival of the Europeans to the shores of North America, the traditional native pattern of living was radically altered. Gradually, the Indians became more dependent on the white settlers. Any prolonged contact between two societies with different cultures causes change to occur in both societies. Now, each borrows cultural traits from each other, particularly if the newly acquired trait is better than a traditional trait. Initially, the English depended upon the Indians, and in many instances, would have probably not able to survive without their help. The natives provided the newcomers with food in time of shortages. They also taught them how to hunt and fish and how to live in their new environment. The traditional settlements provided a convenient place for the natives to barter their corn and pelts for highly coveted English goods. But by the early 1670s, they realized the terrible price they had to pay for these benefits. With the beaver trade dwindling and the wampum replaced with the English coin, the natives were heading for a storm. With no longer a reliable source of income, they quickly became indebted to the traders. And on top of that, there was mounting pressure from the Puritan government for the Indians to abandon their beliefs and accept the white man's God as the true God. Ancient tribal rituals and customs branded by the Puritans of being morally wrong or anti-Christian were outlawed. The powwows and the shamans, the traditional holy men and healers held in high esteem by the Indians people were prevented by law from practicing their craft. They had to operate underground. Gradually, the natives were being forced to turn away from their ancient ways of life and assimilate. But of course, they were really not fully accepted in the mainstream of the New England white society. But hold on, there's more. The Puritan government of Massachusetts embarked upon an official course of action to have all the Indians in the colony confined to a specifically designed area of independent townships run by the missionaries. These were actually nothing more than reservations. The Native Americans called them praying towns. They were spread out to central mass. The policy was not unlike apartheid imposed by the government of South Africa between 1948 and 1991 against the blacks and other non-Caucasians. The conversion of a growing number of the natives to Christianity eroded the stability of the tribe unit from within. A constant state of turmoil and unrest was created by the spread of organized religion. Opposing viewpoints often pitted friends against neighbors and even close relatives against one another. Frequent and often heated arguments between rival fractions within the tribe threatened to disrupt the peace and harmony of what had previously been a close-knit group. And finally, the natives were deliberately and systematically being disposed of their tribal lands to make room for the ever-expanding white population. The English greed for land was insatiable. Just prior to the outbreak of the King Philip War, representatives of the Massachusetts government served the Nipmuc Sachems, the Nipmuc chiefs, with a, an official notice that all vacant or unapproved land within the colony's jurisdiction will be taken over for distribution to prospective settlers. This issue was one of the greatest contributing factors to the problem of the mounting racial tension between the Central Mass Indians and the ruling white government. Now, of course, the Massachusetts authorities were aware that the native people were seasonal people and didn't live in permanent villages. So basically, if the natives didn't live like the white people, didn't fence in their property, live in log homes and raise domestic cattle, then their lands were basically open for settlement. What a sad day for the natives to return to their summer planting fields and find a new settlement and the hopelessness of not being able to do one thing about it. So who was Medicom, also known as King Philip? 
He was born around the time of the Pequot Wars, about 20 years after the arrival of the Pilgrims. He knew no other world but one of which the English and the Wampanoag lived together. Even his name Philip, which is given to him by the Pilgrims, suggested that he was comfortable in the two cultures. He came to age in the late 1650s in a world his forefathers could not even have imagined. He fancied fine English lace work and finely detailed wampum, and he counted among his close friends both English and Indian, and was often seen walking through the streets of Boston. But as he approached manhood, though, Philip became more aware of his father's unease. Massasoit's tribal borders has receded, and disease has continued to thin the Wampanoags. And his trusted friend, Edward Winslow, had died, and the new leadership at Plymouth had little memory of the time when they were needed. Shortly after Winslow's death, Massasoit passes away in 1661. The following year, Philip's brother, Wansuta, the next Sachem, died soon after making a peace treaty with the English. Suspicions were rampant that the English had poisoned him. Tensions between the Wampanoags and the colonies were reaching alarming levels. As the English expanded their settlements to include over 90 towns, the natives were being continuously pushed inland and away from the eastern seaboard. Naturally, the war was the result of a number of accumulative events, but the discovery of John Saswin's body at the Asaswamps Pond would be the prime instigator. The English hanged three of Philip's men for the supposed crime, which Philip saw as an affront to his jurisdiction. Philip had had enough. There has been a lot of debate and controversy lately regarding the name of the Great Falls as Turner's Falls. So who was Turner? William Turner was born in the town of Dartmouth in the county of Devonshire, England. The date of birth is unknown, probably between 1621 and 1625. He grew up during the rule of King Charles I. King Charles was badly in debt and constantly at odds with the Parliament, whose members disapproved of his treatment, civil rights of his people. As a Baptist, Turner and his people of Dartmouth supported the parliamentary opponents of the king. Baptists believed in strong civil liberties, separation of church and state, and complete religious freedom. Turner, anticipating the chaos of what a civil war would mean, he determined to leave England and made his way to the New World. As the ship landed in Boston Harbor, he walked the dockside of Dorchester, where he decided to work for work. He had training skills as a tailor and soon found work as an apprenticeship with Master Tailor Henry Hubbard of Dorchester. The townspeople encouraged him to join the Puritan church. Unaware of any fellow Baptist in the community and unsure of the colonist's attitude towards them, he became a member. By 1645, William had married, became a master tailor, and opened his shop on the main road through Dorchester. Two years passed, and in 1651, a customer brought news of the prosecution of Baptists in Lynn, Massachusetts. The charge awakened old feelings to the former Baptist. Angered and curious, he felt that the Baptists in the New World seemed to be treated as they had been in England. He was determined to view the trial of the three defendants who were accused of defying the Puritan church. Two of the accused were fined, but one refused and was whipped 30 lashes on his back in public. By 1660, a small Baptist community was forming in Boston. Two years later, Turner and his family of seven joined them. They planned to declare publicly the intent to form a Baptist church. It was a bad sign given the Puritans' attitude towards religious descendants. By August the next year, the plan for the Baptist church was under attack and Turner was arrested and ordered banished from the city. He refused to leave Boston and escape punishment until May 1668 when he and two other members of the base Baptists were arrested, bound in chains, and led off to the Boston prison. 
After almost eight months of confinement in a dank, airless cell, he was given the option of remaining in prison or banishment to an island east of Charleston in the Boston Harbor. He chose banishment. The next year passed peacefully for the Turner family. He had set up shop on the island while his son Joshua maintained the tailor shop in Boston. But he was soon again arrested on a forbidden trip to Boston to visit his family. Turner's arrest resulted in another prison sentence when he again refused to recant his Baptist convictions. Conditions in a damp cell caused his joints to stiffen and he complained of pain that spread from his arms, shoulders, and neck. In his agony, his wife he married the year before had died, leaving the young children once again without care. June 1675 saw the outbreak of the King Philip War, and by the next year the English colonists, with too few volunteers among them, feared that the war was going to favor the Indians. The desperate need for both soldiers and competent leaders led Governor John Leverett of Massachusetts to release William Turner from prison. Now, the governor retained the strong feelings against his prisoner's beliefs, but agreed that if Turner would raise a company of men to fight Philip's groups, he would grant him his freedom and give him rank of captain. As you can imagine, Turner had a long time on his hands to think. As a Baptist, he believed in strong civil liberties, separation of church and state, and complete religious freedom. Now, the view would coincide with the Native Americans' beliefs. The Puritan view, everything is in God's hands, God willing. The massacre at Turner's Falls was in God's hands. And if there were Indian victories, it was because they didn't pray enough or they labored on the Sabbath. William Turner's true thoughts and feelings, we will never know. I am very fortunate to speak with Peter Thomas, former professor of the University of Vermont Archaeological Department, a native of Deerfield, and knows the history in the area intimately. Peter Thomas. Hi, my name is Pete Thomas. While the major focus of what we've been talking about is, is Turner's Falls and the fight at Turner's Falls, that engagement is really a culmination of a series of events that unfolded in New England and then spilled over to the Connecticut Valley during the previous 10 months. The war begins in eastern Massachusetts uh, in the town of Swansea uh, with a raid there. It stays in eastern Massachusetts for the next couple of months. And we have John Pynchon in Springfield, for example, not believing that it's going to come to the Connecticut Valley. He still is relying on the local uh, Agawam Indians and others that he knows to act as scouts to give him a warning if um, the Wampanoag and Nipmuc should be heading uh, west. Uh, he lets them keep their guns and, and everything seems to be um, on, an, on an even keel here in the valley. By August, things have changed. And the initial engagement here in the valley occurs in August when the troops are sent out from eastern Massachusetts and they try and take the guns away from the Indians at Norwalk. And after a series of back and forth uh, communications, the Indians there leave en masse one night and try to escape. And the English forces catch up with them in a swamp uh, north of uh, Hatfield. And there's a long-term engagement. Nine Englishmen die and a number of Indians die. From there, it just it kind of snowballs. Um, there are very small communities in what is now Deerfield and in Northfield. Uh, there's approximately 16 families in Northfield. There's about 32 families in Deerfield. And these are really on the margin of English settlement and really exposed to attack 
unless they get reinforced. So there's some initial attempts at reinforcement. They finally decide that they're going to abandon Deerfield um, and they're going to bring some grain down that's been growing in Greenfield to Hadley to be milled for the army. It gets, the convoy gets attacked uh, at Bloody Brook. Uh, 70 soldiers are killed, including 14 uh, Teamsters that are bringing the grain to the south that lived in Deerfield. And in one morning's engagement, we have 14 Deerfield residents dead, leaving something like uh, 13 wives and 40 kids fatherless. So it's a major, uh, has a major effect in terms of people living in the Connecticut Valley. Northfield's attacked and abandoned. Uh, Beers that went up to relieve them is attacked and his soldiers are killed. Uh, it's not going well for the English at all. Uh, in very short order, Springfield is overrun uh, and burned, about 30 houses. So when you put it all together, by the time they reach the winter, so from August to December, there have been roughly 100 soldiers and 45 settlers in, from the Connecticut Valley killed. And this is how that year, 1675, ends. Our next destination, the site of the massacre on the Gill side of the river. We follow the same route Turner's men had taken as they arrive at the native encampment that fateful morning. This most likely would have been the scene from Turner's troops as they assembled above, waiting for the break of dawn. Ironically, the center of the village could have possibly been located at the present day Wagon Wheel restaurant. And what's equally ironic is that the wheel is the symbol of life for the natives, the circle of life. I was fortunate to be able to speak with Kevin McBride, professor of the University of Connecticut Anthropology Department, research director of the Pequot Museum, and chief researcher of the Turner's Falls Battlefield Report. I asked Kevin if there was anything that stood out or surprised him regarding the native camps surrounding the falls in early May 1676. Um, the other thing that's different is just the coalition of you know, the, the many native groups who are not only fighting in King Philip's War against the English, but were present here. Um, Quabog, Nipmuc, you know, Narragansett, Nashaway, Comtuck, uh, Hortuck, um, wide range. And I think that's a, you know, just basically a, that coalition, if you will, is a sort of testimony to the to, you know, native realization that, you know, if they, if they didn't, you know, coordinate, get together and try to defeat the English, their way of life was probably over. Um, Let's get back to the battlefield report. The English began their march just after dark on May 18th. Turner's forces traveled north through Hatfield Meadows on the road towards Deerfield, staying on the west side of the Connecticut River, remaining east of the Deerfield River. It is clear the English commanders chose to avoid this region up ahead and search for a point to cross the Deerfield farther to the west. Let's head down to the Red Rock Crossing Ford, Deerfield, Massachusetts. The Red Rock Ford was a well-known crossing point on the Deerfield River, which allowed quick access to the western meadows of Deerfield. If Turner's company crossed at this point, they would have avoided the native lookout post of the Deerfield Ford and the Cheapside. As Turner's men passed the crossing area here, they would have noticed the native's new planting fields adjacent to the Ford. News arrived at Hatfield. The enemy have planted is judged 300 acres of choice ground at Deerfield. 
Now it's important to note that the Pocumtucks had left their native lands of Deerfield some 10 years earlier in 1665. That's 11 years before the King Philip War. Now their planting fields would have been overgrown. The ideal location, the very spot where the villagers of Deerfield planted their crops just one year earlier. Turner's men crossed the meadows, traveling north, past Pine Hill, then crossing the Deerfield River at the northwest corner. The English forces likely had prior intelligence of native sentries positioned at the Deerfield River Ford and Cheapside overlooking the ford. Cheapside is a prominent rock outcrop at the southern end of Rocky Mountain, rising several hundred feet above the Deerfield River. Cheapside was used by native soldiers as an outpost and possible fortification, which had a commanding view of the northern Deerfield Meadows to the south and two well-known fords to the south. Let's head to the location where the militia crossed the deer field. I'll be standing on the north side of the bank right here. Definition of a crossing ford. A ford is a shallow place with good footing where a river or stream may be crossed by wading. One way in, one way out. The natives located at Cheapside, Meridian Street, and Smead Island were the gatekeepers to the south. Unfortunately, at the time of Turner's arrival, they left a few gates open. Let's cross the ford. The time is close to midnight. The line of horses crossing the ford would have stretched over a quarter of a mile. According to accounts, there was a full moon. There was also reports of thunderstorms. Epsert's from the battlefield report. It appears that the noise made by Turner's 150 dragoons may have been detected by native sentries in the vicinity, even though they forded the Deerfield River well to the west. These Indians, it is said, overheard the crossing of the troops and turned out with torches and examined the usual fort, but finding to traces there and hearing no further disturbance, concluded that the noise was made by moose crossing. So they went back to sleep. Once Turner's company had passed the native sentries deployed around Cheapside and the Deerfield River, they continued north through Greenfield Meadow. If the assault was to be successful, the element of surprise was essential. The approach at night would lessen the danger of detection, and the noise of the water going over the falls would add to the element of surprise. Getting there would be half the battle, but getting back would be the key. One route to arrive and the same route to depart would lessen any chance of error. But the most critical part of the operation was timing. A quick attack and withdrawal would be the key factor if Turner's troops were to survive the assault without heavy casualties. Heading north, they crossed the Route 291 Rotary, riding parallel to Route 91, crossing the Greenfield River at the Cherry Brook. From the Green River swimming area, they turn eastward parallel to Silver Street, making sure to bypass Smead Island, an area where a large native force was located. The militia travels forward northeast on Route 2. We take the high ground skirting White Ash Swamp to our right. We now arrive at our destination, a steep bluff overlooking Factory Hollow. According to William Hubbard, when they came near the Indians' rendezvous, they alighted off their horses and tied them to some young trees at a quarter mile distance. Turner stationed an unknown number of soldiers to guard the horses while the rest of the company crossed the Fall River at a ford below the terrace. Thoughtful eyes peer fearfully right and left into the thickets, crowding together in terror at the hoot of an owl or bark of the fox or wolf sure that each was the war whoop of a pursuing foe. Estimated time 4 a.m. as they wade across the river single file, ascending the steep slope on the east side of the river, the forces gather on a high hill overlooking one of the encampments at Pecumscot. One source states that the soldiers got hither after a hard march about break of day. Captain Turner and Lieutenant Holyoke likely planned the upcoming assault at that moment. 
now that they had a rough visual in the early morning hours of the Native American encampment on the northern side of the Great Falls. We came upon them before daybreak, they having no sentinels or scouts abroad, as thinking themselves secure by reason of their remote distance from any of our plantations. The Indians so fast asleep that some of the men were able to put their guns even into the wigwams as they moved into position. All that is known that on a given signal, the English forces opened fired. The attack, fierce and sudden, allowed no time for the Indians to rally. Confused and terrified, they made but a feeble resistance. Many fell within the wigwam, others shouting that the Mohawks were upon them. No discrimination was made. The women and children felt easy prey and were put to the sword. One account describes the English forces fell in amongst them and killed several hundred of them upon the place, they being out of posture or order to make any formidable resistance. We poured in the shot amongst them and made a great and notable slaughter. Many sought refuge among the rocks under the banks where Captain Holyoke, discovering some old persons and children, set the example of indiscriminate massacre by slaying five of them old and young with his sword. Unarmed old men, women, and children ran away from the English soldiers towards the banks of the Connecticut River. They got into their canoes to paddle away, but the paddlers being shot, the canoes overset with all their in, and the stream of the river being very violent and swift, were carried upon the falls of the water. From thence, tumbling down, were broken into pieces. We likewise here demolished two forges they had to mend their arms and took them away and their material and tools and threw them into the river. In addition to the forges and munitions, Turner soldiers encountered large stores of dried smoked fish which they destroyed on sight, then put to fire their homes and provisions. One of the captains that Turner's men rescued was an English boy who told the English soldiers that King Philip was nearby with a thousand troops. The boy's warning spread through the English ranks who believed the rumors that a thousand native soldiers were on the march, and a panicked withdrawal began. The roar of the muskets and the cries of the assault had already aroused the other Indian camps on the other side of the river and on Smead Island. The warriors were astir and hastened to the assistance of their ill-fated comrades. Let's pause a moment and take a closer look at what had happened that fateful morning. Let's start with the location. Here's a satellite view of present-day Turner's Falls looking north. The Turner's Falls bridge is in the foreground. The Connecticut River of the past looked quite different than the river of today. For a large portion of the Native American camp now lays underwater. The construction of the dam in the 20th century backed up the river, flooding the area and forming the present-day Barton's Cove. To the left, we have the Gill boat ramp. To the right, Barton's Island. Once again, facing north, the Turner's Falls Bridge in the foreground. Let's get a view of what it may have looked like at the time of the raid in spring of 1676. It's unclear how large the encampments were on the north and south side of the Connecticut River, but they both appear to run the length from the Great Falls to the present day Barton's Cove. If Turner's attack focused on the portion of the encampment closest to the falls, which would have been the first they encountered, this may have allowed native peoples further to the southeast to escape. One of the natives captured by English forces following the fight described how he had run away once that fight begun. By reason, the shot came thick as rain, but said also that he was at a great distance, indicating that he may have been farther south or near present-day Barton's Cove. Back to the battlefield report. The survivors of the initial attack who were not able to escape or swim across the river tried to hide and were tracked down by the English soldiers. Other of them were creeping for shelter under the banks of the Great River, were espied by our men and killed with their swords. Captain Holyoke killing five young and old with his own hands from under a bank. The colonists often portrayed the natives in their literature as brutal, barbaric, savage, bloodthirsty heathens. Let's go down the list. Definition of brutal. It's ruthless, cold-blooded. 
Definition of barbaric, relating to a characteristic of a group of people who are alien to another land, culture, or people. Seems like the colonists are barbaric. Savage. Savage, we have lacking restraints, normal to civilized human beings. Bloodthirsty. Definition, murderous, violent, vicious, brutal. And heathen, I guess I'm a heathen. It's a person who does not believe in a widely held religion, specifically one who is not a Christian, Jew, or Muslim. What I'm getting at here is that both sides used brutal, barbaric, and savage tactics. And for Lieutenant Holyoke, running a sword through human beings is close and personal. But it's okay because that was God's will. Puritan, pure Islam, using your God to justify your actions against non-believers. The irony here is that William Turner was jailed for his religious beliefs by the Puritan government and released on condition that he raise a militia to fight King Philip's men. Now, Turner, to his friends, often spoke of the hypocrisy of the Puritan religion, using the word of God to fit their needs and control the population. Once again, the Baptists believed in strong civil liberties, separation of church and state, and complete religious freedom in a peaceful way, which is basically the Native American's point of view. No wonder the Puritan governor had jailed Captain William Turner. My thought is that Turner wanted to prove to the authorities that religion did not hinder his allegiance to the Bay Colony. William Turner, with absolutely no military experience, accepts the mission. Let's head back to the battlefield report on the eastern banks of the Connecticut, where the mismatch of various tribes had congregated. Names like Pawcumtuck, Abenaki, Wampanoag, Nipmuc, Narragansett, Agawam, Nanatuck, Warrenoko, Nashua's, Penacook. No one would have known that this would have been the last great gathering at the Pecumscut. We return to the battlefield report. The Indians that lay scattered on both sides of the river after they recovered themselves and discovered a small number of them assailed them turned head upon the English who in their retreat were disordered. So, so this is where the restaurant is mm -hmm. and this is the retreat road going up through here across Main Road through this guy's yard and then you start climbing up that ridge mm -hmm. and you get up to the top of the ridge up here and there's a gap from the wagon wheel restaurant let's head up to the gap in the mountain i'm presently standing in the area known as the notch if turner's men were to reach the horse tie-off area down below here they would have had no choice but to pass this narrow gap in the mountain classic native ambush tactic is to set ambush from favorable strategic locations. Now in military terms, it's known as a pinch point. Now this is interesting. Jonathan Wells, a 16 year old soldier from Hadley was with a group of 20 soldiers who were late getting back to the assembly point, either because they were among the group counting native casualties or perhaps looting the encampment. Wells and his party continued to be attacked from the rear as they tried to reach the main body of the retreating English. Once again, they would have had to pass this narrow gap. I was very fortunate to have documented this area before they removed the flags last year. Let's pause a moment and take a quick look at the research process that produced the battlefield report. The Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center is conducting the research. The authors of the report include Kevin McBride, Project Director, Roberta Charpentier, Lab Supervisor David Newmack, and Ashley Bessonette, both senior researchers and military historians, with a support staff consisting of survey techs, lab specialists, documenteers, and catalogers. In order to identify, document, survey, and map a battlefield, historians and archaeologists must first research all relevant historical accounts and identify the historic landscape that define the battlefield. Now, once the specialists identify key areas of interest, a team is sent out into the field 
to investigate. The avenue of approach and withdrawal is key to understanding what had taken place, and a key to identifying the route is by the use of metal detectors. Now the crew comes in, scours the area, and when finding a possible object of interest, they place a pink flag. Trailing the metal detectors is the project director and the digging crew. The researchers carefully examine each flag site, and if an object is pertinent to the battle, it would be entered into the global positioning database. From there, a accurate map can be produced. When all the artifacts have been recovered, the flags are removed, and their discoveries are sent to the lab for analysis. Which brings us back to the notch. Just over a year ago, they finished work here. I was fortunate once again to have filmed the area before they removed the flags. Over 90% of the artifacts recovered were musket balls, and most, if not all, were being fired by the natives as Turner's men made their hasty retreat. Follow the flags, follow the retreat. Let's take a look at what I filmed last year. In this clip, I'm going to reenact what I call the gauntlet. Jonathan Wells, a 16-year-old soldier from Hadley, was with a group of 20 soldiers who were obliged to fight with the enemy to recover their horses. These men were late getting back to the assembly point, either because they were among the group counting the native casualties or perhaps looting the encampment. Wells and his party continued to be attacked from the rear as they tried to reach the main body of the retreating English. Notice the angle of the shots fired from above. The gauntlet. First thing to notice is the natives' advantage of the high ground firing down upon the unsuspected troops. Let's move on, head down the hill. Remember, follow the flags, follow the retreat. Once again, Wells and his party continued to be attacked from the rear as they tried to reach the main body of the retreating English. The heavier flag concentrations at this landing may have indicated that the remaining men may have fired a concentrated volley before crossing the same river they had crossed just a few hours earlier. And you can bet that the natives on the opposite side of the bank were waiting. Not far to go. If we can only make it to the horse tie-off area up above. Running the gauntlet from the notch to the tie-off area. Miraculously, the remaining stragglers mounted and traveled south with the natives head on their heels for the muskets did not cease firing until about halfway across the field. Captain Turner's withdrawal plan emphasized the importance of keeping the forces together and also stressed that they return by the same route. Another key to the plan was a speedy withdrawal to prevent the natives from setting up ambushes ahead of them. We return to the battlefield report with a map of the retreating English forces. The arrows indicate the various routes the natives used to counter the English forces as they withdrawed south to eventual safety. It's unclear exactly how the English command structure broke down or exactly how many parties they divided into during the unorganized retreat. It is possible the English column did break into three or four large groups led by Turner, Holyoke, Waite and Hinsdale. The Indian soldiers encamped at Smeed's Island moved north to intercept the English as they retreated west along the White Ash Swamp, setting up ambushes to their front and attacking their flanks. The location of Smeed's Island directly across from the popular site known as the Rock Dam just about a mile and a half from the Great Falls. The large encampment located at Smeed's Island would have surely heard the early morning barrage of muskets firing upon the village at Pecumscut. 
Let's see if we can create a timeline. The distance from Smeeds Island to the Great Falls is about a mile and a half, mile and three quarter. The native runners from the falls could have easily reached the island within 10 or 12 minutes. In my opinion, the forces from Smeed Island were already located at key points along the route of White Ash Swamp a good half hour before the English forces arrived. Well, let's head down to White Ash Swamp. Jonathan Wells account. Native soldiers struck the English soldiers from the cover of White Ash Swamp. Wells noted that he had now got about two miles from the place where he did ye exploit the massacre at the falls. At this two mile mark, he further recalled, now ye had left ye track of ye company and were left to ye Indians that pursued. Traveling south on Route 2A, let's head down to one of the few remaining strips of land known as White Ash Swamp. Once again, Jonathan Wells noted that he had now got about two miles from ye place where ye did ye exploit. At that two mile mark, he further recalled how he had left ye track of ye company and were left to the Indians that pursued. He was only mounted on his horse in the rear of the company a little while before he was fired by three Indians that were very near him. One bullet passed so near him as to brush his hair, another struck his horse behind, and a third his thigh, the bone shattered by ye bullet. Wells nearly fell from his horse but grabbed the animal's mane and pulled himself upright in his saddle. Many English soldiers were either wounded, missing, or killed while fleeing the landscape of White Ash Swamp. The battle continued to move forward. Eventually Wells caught up to the front of the retreating party and represented ye difficulties of ye men in ye rear and urged Captain Turner either turn back to ye relief or tarry a little till they come up and so go off in a body. According to Wells, ye captain replied, he had better save some than lose all. We travel forward to the next engagement on the battlefield map. Location, the bend on route to Burnham Road. And as we travel farther south, we come upon yet another area at present day Bay State Franklin Medical Center. And finally to the east is the route that Captain Turner and Lieutenant Holyoke had taken parallel to Silver Street. Destination, the Green River. As Turner reached the Green River, he bypassed the ford he had used earlier and crossed a little further south, possibly anticipating another confrontation. And it is here where Captain William Turner lost his life crossing the Green River. Taking command, Lieutenant Polio rallied the remaining soldiers and exhorted them not to be terrified, saying, God hath wrought hitherto for us wonderfully. Let us trust in him still. 